Um, I hope to convince you that they are indeed fantastic. Um, it's a slightly um, strange sort of Zoom seminar format here. And I, when I was a postdoc in Swansea, um, I had a, a radio show on a, on a local radio channel and I have to sort of channel that in a DJ um, and trust that there are still people out there that they are interested in what I'm saying and um, they're laughing whenever I make a joke. So um, let's see how it goes. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll introduce these, uh, this fiber optic technology. Um, then we'll take a little bit of an interlude where um, there's a surprise for you. Um, I'll then show you some um, the, the field deployment that we did and wrap up with what I think is, is the future of this, uh, this new and exciting technology. So um, there we go. Now, uh, the alternate title for this talk is um, Nerding Out with Adam, um, because I'm probably not going to tell you a lot of stuff that you didn't already know about the structure and the seismic properties of um, a fast flowing glacier. But it's much more about kind of the technology by which we've we've made those those observations. Um, as I say, it's it's this fantastic fiber optic technology that um, I think is is really exciting, and I hope I can um, inspire and excite you with it as well. Now, um, as Tavi said, I'm now uh, back at the University of Leeds in the the School of Earth and Environment, as you can see it there. Um, that's certainly how I remember it pre-lockdown. It's probably now covered in vines and has been reoccupied by big cats or something like that. Um, but um, that's the School of Earth and Environment at Leeds. And one of the really good things about working there is that there's a whole range of, of geophysical investigations that go on and a whole range of geophysical expertise. Um, basically any application of, of geophysics to any aspect of subsurface investigation goes on there. And so it's a really good place to be a kind of geophysical spy. Um, you can get inspired by practices in, in other sectors of, of geophysical research, and you can kind of pick and choose what you think might work well to try and import within the, the glaciological setting. So a couple of examples here. Um, these are some, um, uh, some projects that are going on with a couple of PhD students that I work with at the moment. Um, Emma Pierce, um, the, the, the image here on the, the right hand side of the screen. Um, Emma's looking at a, a so-called full waveform inversion, which is a, a, a seismic um, technique that's used extensively within the resources industries. And um, what you try and do is, rather than interpreting sections of the, the seismic data, so you, you're not necessarily doing a reflection analysis or a refraction analysis, you're trying to recreate the whole seismic wave field. And if you can do that, then you can say that you've got a pretty good understanding of, of the seismic properties of the subsurface there. Um, coming over onto the left-hand side of the screen, um, what we're looking at here is um, trying to import some some kind of 3D survey methodologies, again, that are used extensively within the resources industries. Um, but here, um, Rebecca Schlegel, a uh, Swansea University PhD student, also working with the British Antarctic Survey. Um, Rebecca is using um, these, these 3D survey approaches and trying to apply them to radar data. And what you can see there is a, um, an, an image of uh, a bed characteristics um, on, uh, on Rutford Ice Stream uh, in Antarctica. Um, so I'm not gonna say too much more about that. I will let Rebecca do that in the various presentations and papers that she's preparing at the moment, but it's um, a whole new way of, of, of looking at geophysical data. And so it's this kind of importing of, of, of different um, styles and different uses of geophysical methods that, that kind of really inspires me. And so the thing that inspired me about this particular seismic technology um, was seeing it used um, throughout various aspects of, of seismic monitoring. Um, and so uh, yeah, one of the things that you've got to do when, when getting inspired in this way is to kind of think, how are you going to um, manage the survey logistics? How are you going to manage the survey budget? Because a lot of these um, industrial type technologies um, require logistics and budgets that are often beyond what we can do in glaciology. But nonetheless, there's often um, uh, practices that you, can, that you can adapt and you can get inspired by. Um, so I was really pleased to get invited by um, 
uh, the, the Responder project that runs out of uh, Scott Polar Research Institute to come and try out some of this fibre optic technology um, on, on the Greenland ice sheet. So this photo here is indeed myself and uh, Andy Clark of Silixa, um, a company that specialises in, in this fibre optic technology, um, properly nerding out on the Greenland ice sheet. So whilst we've got um, you know, wonderful scenery outside of the tent, there we are looking at the finer points of, of a seismic wavelet that we've just recorded. Um, so um, yeah, like I say, nerding out with Adam. So in this talk, I'm going to give an overview of what is um, fibre optic seismology and what this technology is all about. Um, what it has done for us, with some reference to our uh, the field deploy the field deployment that we could do back back when we were we were able to do field work, um, and um, what it could do for us in the future, um, an outlook to um, why I think it's so fantastic, why I think it's potentially game changing within the way that we um, conduct seismic surveys in glaciology. So if we're going to think about that game changer, then first we need to understand the game in the first place. So um, I thought I'd just give you a quick overview of the, the way that we use um, seismic methods on ice at the moment. Here we've got a basic cross section through, through a glacier or an ice mass, you've got some ice, sat on some sediment, eventually underlain by some bedrock. Um, in particular fast flowing ice streams, maybe there's some sense of, of, of an isotrope, uh, um, an isotropic transition down there, something to do with a, a flow fabric. But these are typical kind of P wave velocities that you, you might expect within the ice, within the isotropic part, and then within the anisotropic part where, as I say, there's potentially this developed flow fabric. We come along and we do a glacier seismic survey. We've got a seismic source and a whole series of surface receivers called geophones, and we send reflection energy from the source, uh, so seismic reflection energy from the source to the receivers. Now I appreciate here that I'm talking about active seismic sur surveying and, and reflection seismic surveying. Of course there's lots of other different uses of, of seismology within, within glaciology, but this is what we're talking about in this particular talk. Um, and that propagation of seismic energy um, has been used to, to, to quantify many aspects of, um, of, of the glacier seismic properties and to tell us a lot of useful properties about the, the, the overall glacier system. For example, we can look at the travel time of seismic energy and because we can figure out the distance that that seismic energy has traveled, we can say something about the seismic velocity. We can look at the strength of reflections. That tells us something about the material contrast either side of the glacier bed. So it can tell us that, okay, we, we know that we're traveling through ice at the bottom, the reflection strength will change depending on, on what the, the subglacial environment is like. We can also start to look at the, the energy loss um, of, of that energy, and that has been linked previously to, to the end glacial temperature. So in this way, we can start to, um, we can start to figure out lots of very useful, very interesting seismic properties of, of ice. Now, um, that's been used for, for decades, and our old faithful workhorses are these geophones that we use. So um, you can imagine that you go out with potentially hundreds of these things, lay them out across the surface of the glacier, and you record your seismic energy. And the geophone technology, the way that we listen to the seismic energy coming back to us, hasn't really changed for, for decades. Um, here's a schematic through, through what a geophone is. It's all based around this principle that if you've got a coil of wire and you've got a, a magnet moving inside that coil, it will generate a current within that wire. So you imagine that you've got your geophone anchored to the, to the ice surface. When seismic energy arrives at the ice surface, makes a, a small vibration, it causes this coil mounted on this spring to, um, to, to wiggle up and down, and that generates a current inside this, uh, inside this coil. And that's what gets fed to our seismic system and gives us the seismic wavelet. So that's the way a geophone works. That's what has uh, served us very, very well for, for many, many years. Nothing wrong with that. But technology moves on, and there are now different ways to sense seismic vibrations. And this is where the fiber optic seismology comes in. So kind of interchangeable terminologies here. You've got 
distributed acoustic sensing or DAS is equivalent to, to fiber optic seismology. And in the terms of fiber optic seismology, the clues in the name. Um, this is a, a nice graphic from, uh, from the company Silixa. Um, what you've got is a length of fiber optic cable. And you've got a really powerful computer up here that's called an interrogator. And that interrogator is firing pulses of laser energy into the fiber optic cable. Now the fiber optic cable isn't perfect. It's got minor kind of deficiencies along, its, along the wall of it. And so as the fiber optic pulse is propagating through the cable, a portion of it is backscattered back to the interrogator. Now, that's all very well and good, but then along comes a seismic wave. We've got a source of seismic energy over here that's, you know, seismic waves are propagating towards the cable. And when the seismic waves reach the cable, they do a small bit of deformation of that cable. And that change in, in the length of the cable, that slight deformation, changes the amount of laser energy that's being backscattered to the interrogator. And the interrogator has internal algorithms that from that change in, in, the, in the backscattered energy, it can reconstruct what the seismic wavelet looked like at that particular point. Now, I find that technology pretty mind-blowing. Um, I've used explosives on ice, I've gone around smacking glaciers with sledgehammers, and although you think that you make quite a big bang at the ice surface, I've always thought that by the time the seismic signal gets a kilometre away, um, it, it's really a, a pretty puny signal by that point. But still, the, the, the ground deformation is enough to vibrate this fiber optic cable in such a way that um, this interrogator is able to reconstruct the seismic wavelet. And I, that's, that, that's mind blowing as far as I'm concerned. I think it's, it's, it's such a, a, a cool technology. Like I say, I'm, I'm nerding out here, right? But you know, it's, it's really cool. Um, what it offers you is, is continuous sampling in time, but more importantly, near continuous sampling, probably with a sample interval of something like 10 meters in space. And that's much more dense than the layout that you could get with um, a, a number of geophones, particularly when you imagine that you could lay out kilometers of this fiber optic cable if you so desired. Um, it, it's also a flexible survey geometry, as in wherever you put the fiber optic cable, you can start recording seismic energy at that point. Now, one of the other benefits of this is that as well as doing distributed acoustic sensing and reconstructing the seismic response, you can also do distributed temperature sensing and you can uh, investigate the thermal properties of the material that your, your cable is installed in. And we'll come back to that towards the end of this talk where we'll, we'll, we'll do a little bit of comparison between the acoustic response that I'll show you and a temperature response that um, one of the other researchers on the Responder project is, is working on. So, exciting stuff. Um, here's an example of DAS being used in a, um, a CO2 sequ uh, sequestration experiment. Um, what you've got here is each of these seismic records, these, these eight of them, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, there are eight, they're missing six for some reason. Um, so uh, this, this set of data here is, is a time-lapse experiment. So each one of these um, records is, is a step through time. And they all look pretty similar. And that suggests that the ground isn't changing very much. But within the red box, um, you can see that there's a seismic event that seems to evolve and seems to grow stronger through time. Um, and this is at the depth level where the experiment was injecting carbon dioxide into the ground as a, as a storage facility. Um, and so that, for me, has kind of real resonances with the way that we could monitor the seismic properties and the seismicity um, within, within a glacier. Um, so it, it was exciting for me to get involved with. Um, so does this sort of spell the end for, for geophones? What, what would you do if you could deploy um, a, a fiber optic cable on the glacier? Do you get rid of them and, and deploy it at surface? Well, yes, you could, but the experiment that I'm going to show you is, is a borehole deployment of, of the fiber optic cable. Now, with a borehole deployment, we're measuring the in situ ice properties. So our borehole, our, our fiber optic cable is, is in direct contact with, with the ice 
the, um, with the subsurface, but in our case with the ice, that we're really interested in. And that's advantageous because it, it gives us a lot more accurate control on what those seismic properties of the ice are. Um, what I mean by that is that in the diagram I showed you before where we had the reflection ray paths, um, I mean, it's impressive that we can say anything about the ice at all, right? Because we have a surface platform and we might be trying to figure out the seismic properties of some horizon that's kilometers away from us. So the fact we can do that with any degree of accuracy whatsoever is really impressive. But for the borehole deployment, we send energy from the source into the borehole and all the while we're just looking directly at the in situ properties and, and that's really valuable to us. The other problem is that with the seismic reflection setup, if you've got low reflectivity, if, if all these horizons that I've sketched are, if they don't represent a big seismic contrast, then you're not going to get a lot of seismic energy reflected back to surface. And so no matter what you do, it will be very difficult to, um, uh, to, to do a high signal to noise ratio characterization of the data that you get back because there simply isn't the reflectivity there. Here's an example of this actually from um, a, a downstream site from, from where um, we, we applied the, uh, the fiber optic methods. Um, these are data from uh, Kuhn Hofstetter on, on store glacier. Um, and in this work, Kuhn identified three reflectors within this um, seismic data set. Um, the bed reflection is this R327 in the middle. So a very, very low amplitude, poor quality bed reflection, simply because it seems that there are, there's low reflectivity bed conditions there. Um, this one up here turns out to be an anisotropic transition. Here we have a subglacial reflection. But this just highlights the point that if we have this low reflectivity material, we're going to get very poor seismic responses from that. Um, and that's, that's overcome within the borehole um, style deployment. The other thing that I would point out is that the DAS cable monitors in, in a passive sense. And so actually, um, you can detect end glacial seismicity. And I'll show you at the end of this talk um, some examples of, of the end glacial seismicity that is continually going off while we're doing all these surveys um, around, around the glacier. So um, kind of <laughs> hope I'm inspiring you and hope that it, it sounds like an exciting data set. Um, I can talk all day about the, the advantages of the, the fiber optic seismology, but there are of course some limitations um, and they are to do with um, the, the directional sensitivity. So um, what you've got to imagine is that um, I've got a geophone, the example I showed you before, when that geophone vibrates up and down, so seismic energy arrives, it vibrates the, the geophone, we get um, a seismic response. But of course, seismic energy doesn't only come straight up, it can come from any direction. And there can be different types of seismic energy that have a different sense of, of vibration, a sense of particle motion. Now, I could install a three component geophone that's sensitive to movement in the up down direction. It's sensitive to movement in a crossways direction and in the orthogonal crossways direction. And that allows me to capture the full seismic wave field, no matter what direction the ice is vibrating in, in response to the, the seismic wavelet, the three component geophone can capture it. That's not the case with, with the DAS cable that we are using. So I'll, I'll just show you an example of this. Um, let's say that I've got um, some P wave energy, so some com compressional wave energy. If my energy is traveling from top to bottom, then the sense of particle motion will be in that same direction. Okay, so that's that's the P wave. That's it, it's a, um, a longitudinal wave. That's the definition of a P wave. Here we have though a shear wave. Now, if I've got a shear wave again traveling from top to bottom, its particle motion will be from side to side. So orthogonal compared to uh, the, the P wave energy. Now it turns out that the cable, the DAS cable is only sensitive to deformation along its axis, or at least it's, it's less sensitive to oblique um, arrivals. So if I've got energy traveling from my seismic source down the length of the fiber optic cable like that, then I'm going to detect my P wave quite happily. 
but I'm not going to, tech my, de to detect my shear wave energy because the center of particle motion is, is in the wrong direction. It, the, the cable is not sensitive to it. If I take my source over off to one side, I, I offset it so I've got oblique arrivals coming in, then maybe I'm less sensitive to my P wave, but I am more sensitive to my S wave. And so in that sense, the, um, the cable has kind of like a directional filter built into it. And, um, you know, that, that's, well, <laughs> it's a fact of the matter. And uh, it, it, it's problematic if you're specifically trying to record, say, shear waves from vertically traveling energy. Um, but as you'll see in the acquisition that we did, um, we, we kind of varied up the, the, the azimuths and the offsets of the cable so we could test out this, this sensitivity to, to P wave and, and S wave energy. So there's a precursor to the, um, the, the, the field that we're, we're going to do, the basic principles of fiber optic seismology. Um, I appreciate that that's like potentially quite a lot to take in. So I just thought I would potentially open the floor to, to see if there was any questions, you know, as a, as a bit of a, a palate cleanser, as I've got going on there before the, uh, the deployment to Store Glacier. So um, it might be a little bit, um, um, you know, different, but I thought I would just take some um, some interlude questions if anyone if anyone had them. Um, I don't know if Tavy, you usually chair the question session, but um, you know if uh, if that sounds okay. There's a couple of little discussion points on the chat, um, Adam. Okay, I'll see if I can pull that up. Okay, yeah, the, I can see the chat there. Um, Okay, so I see, uh, how do you differentiate from other sources of vibration in the cable like the wind? Um, I guess that um, you, whether it's the cable or whether it's a geophone, um, you're gonna have different frequency responses. And yes, as I see there, as you, you've got, um, uh, uh, Ken has said, you know, it's, it's frequency filtering, for example. You might expect that the, uh, the seismic wave has lower frequencies than, than the wind noise. And again, if you couple it to the ground, in our borehole deployment, um, obviously the wind noise is, is less problematic because we've almost got it you know, deep down in the glacier and it's free from the range, uh, free from the, the wind. Um, we have a, a frequency range there uh, question. So the frequency of our seismic energy, I'll show you that later on. Um, but um, certainly uh, the way that the, uh, the DAS cable works um, it does limit the frequencies that you can pick up. I think we're kind of at the high frequency range, particularly uh, for, for our particular DAS cable. Um, maybe we revisit that one at the end when I've shown you the kind of frequency ranges that we've got. Um, next one down was a, a single or multi-mode uh, fiber. This one's a multi-mode fiber. Um, uh, we have a question from Andre. Uh, how do you make a good acoustic contact with the ice? Um, what we were using, as I'll show you in a few slides time, is um, a hot water um, uh, drilling system. And so gradually through time, uh, the borehole freezes up and effect effectively welds uh, the fiber optic in place. Um, I think it's more problematic if you're doing a surface uh, seismic survey um, where, I mean, certainly I'll, I'll show you some pictures from the field in a second, um, but um, the, 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 the terrain gets quite hummocky. And I think if you deployed the, 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 the surface fiber optic cable, uh, you may well find that it's kind of draped between hummocks, which obviously wouldn't offer um, a good coupling to the ice there. Um, again, it's uh, something that I think advantages us uh, in, in the, uh, the use of this, this borehole deployment. Okay, I think that's covered all of them that were in the, the chat. Um, Again, we, I, I will answer some questions towards uh, at the end of this talk. Um, and uh, yeah, so thanks very much for, for the engagement on the, on the old chat there. So we'll, we'll resume. Um, right, so just before we, uh, we head off to the field then, I just wanted you to share uh, the insight of some field glaciologists. This is the, the, um, the interlude I was uh, mentioning. I did get asked on Twitter to do a, a bassoon interlude um, but um, I'm not going to do that. I'll save you the I'll save you the tunes. Instead, I'll show you this wish list of 30 field glaciologists. So this is a an outreach poll that 
um, I was I, I I I polled 30 glaciologists on their opinions about um, what they take into the field with them, assuming that they've got all of their safety gear and that you're then not going to freeze. What three things do you then make sure you've got packed? The um, this was an outreach uh, project that I wanted to do as part of our Thwaites Glacier Time project, but um, it, it ended up getting cancelled because of uh, the coronavirus situation. Um, and um, But nonetheless, I polled the glaciologist, and so I thought I would just share with you uh, the results. Now, of course, when you ask 30 glaciologists for three suggestions, you get some quite idiosyncratic um, responses. And so I'm only showing here responses that got more than two uh, suggestions for what people would take. So here goes. Um, first off, receiving two votes each were some Sharpies. And even though you've presumably got enough socks to stop you from freezing, people want to take more socks. So um, yeah, when I've been, a field, when I've been in the field um, and you feel that cold coming in through the bottoms of your boots, it's it's really depressing. So yeah, I can well empathize with the feeling for more stops. Um, next, getting three votes were creature comforts, a whole selection of them. Um, things that look after the glaciologist more than they do the glaciology. So we had a nice split between coffee and tea drinkers there, which is quite cool. Um, people want to take chili sauce to, I guess, spice up the, uh, the dehydrated food rations or so. Um, chocolate, some books. I actually thought alcohol would do would score a lot more highly on this, um, but maybe that says more about me than it does the rest of the, the field community. On that note, this is water, I promise you. Um, next is uh, glaciologists taking care of themselves in the sun. So um, receiving four votes, people pack extra sunscreen and uh, sunscreen and some lip balm. Uh, five votes, some audio technology. So uh, everyone wants to take a uh, uh, a music player or a or a, a, a audio book player. Then uh, we we skipped six votes and moved to seven. So um, people will make sure they've packed a buff, the very very versatile buff, turn it into a bandana or a face guard or whatever, particularly um, at the moment. Um, and it seems that the world is held together with some form of of sticky tape. Not naming any particular brand names, um, but uh, you can make your own mind up there. And the number one thing that uh, everyone seems to want to pack is a, a multi-tool. And I take from this that uh, no matter how complicated our glaciological systems are, uh, you need some tape and you need a multi-tool to, to, to fix the world. So um, yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, I would thank everyone who, who took part in that and I will be using it when our outreach event um, launches back in the real world. Um, if anyone wants that data to use in their in their own um, glaciological outreach talks, then um, feel free to, to get in touch with me and I'll, I'll happily send that on. So um, there's the interlude. We're, we're going off to the field now. So, um, yeah, um, the um, the deployments that we undertook, um, I've already mentioned, were uh, took place on store glacier um, back in the days when we could do um, field surveying. Um, there are two sites of interest that I want to talk about in particular. Um, this is a map of, of Store Glacier in uh, West Greenland. It's a, a fast flowing glacier. Um, around these two sites, uh, S30 and L028, um, it's flowing at something like 600 meters per year. So L028 is our actual field site. It's the, the drained bed of a superglacial lake. Um, it, it drains through a, a hydro fracture. And now it's just um, a, a fairly kind of still some meltwater channels flowing there. There's a moulin not far away from the drill site, but um, <laughs> we're no longer underwater. Um, you can read up on uh, the structure of L028 and, and the hydrofracture in Tom Chudley's uh, 2019 paper. But um, the other site I would draw your attention to is this site S30. This is the site where Kuhn Hofstede was working, where I showed you that seismic data previously. And a couple of um, important observations that, that Kuhn made was that he saw um, a change in the, the anisotropic fabric of the glacier. That's around 84% of ice thickness, which is this reflection that he sees coming in that he labelled R280. Um, he saw a low reflectivity glacier bed but then this strong subglacial horizon, presumably with subglacial sediment there, which is labelled R358. 
And so that size S30, um, we are now uh, in 2019 in July, uh, we undertook some field trials um, at uh, L028. And this was kind of formed the basis of our um, understanding of what the situation might be like at site L028. Here is our drill site. Um, you can see here that th there are some of the hummocks that that we um, that I alluded to in the in the questions there, places where the cable you'd think might drape over the ice surface. And this is um, quite early, but then as you'll know, it doesn't take long before um, the the surface of the ice becomes even more uh, channelized, um, more melted than this. And so, kind of. The, the situation's only going to get worse, if you like. Uh, but here's the drill apparatus. This is the, the Aberystwyth um, drilling system. Um, you've got the, the drill stem there with a the hot water drill hose going through. Um, there's a spool of fiber optic cable that's ready to be deployed as soon as, we, um, as, soon as we're ready. Um, and we drilled down to the bed at um, 1,043 meters depth. Now, uh, this is a, a video I'm going to show you. What happens in here is that the um, this is the, the the borehole full of water, and then that water uh, is going to drain when we when we hit the bed. Now, it, it's a it's a video of which nothing happens other than seeing a borehole drain. But I stood hunched over this borehole for hours waiting for the thing to drain with my camera at the ready. So um, I sacrificed a lot, you will watch. So Bryn's shouting because he's seen that the load on the cable has increased as you get all this frictional drag of the water um, starting to drain down the borehole, but you can see it going down there. Yeah, as Paul Christopherson points out, it's a, a nice and steady drainage. Woo. Indeed, woo, it drained. So um, that, that we, that's why we think that we reached the, the glacier bed. Um, other boreholes in the area that the team drilled also drained um, in that way at, at a very similar depth and it wouldn't be expected that each of these boreholes has hit um, a, a basal crevasse. Um, so um, we, we think we're, we're at the glacier bed in, in a vertical borehole. Um, having installed that borehole, which is the, the orange dot that you can see in the middle of our seismic array, each of these dots uh, represents a seismic shot location or at least a set of seismic shot locations. Um, our um, seismic source is me with a, a sledgehammer so he's a little bit of a gratuitous video um, but um, it, it was a seven kilogram sledgehammer striking a, a plastic plate and we stacked up say 35 shots um, at each of these locations. We also did a lot of uh, shots just by the borehole, which is what this uh, video is here, um, just so we could capture the kind of variation, the time-lapse variation of, of the structure around the borehole. Again, I'll, I'll show you some um, images of that later on. Um, but the fiber optic cable has been put in the borehole there and we have these so-called zero offset shots and then some offset shots at various azimuths and along various offsets from the borehole. Um, here's Andy uh, continually and very dedicatedly monitoring um, the seismic responses coming in. And there's two data sets that I'm going to show you in, in the next few slides. Um, one that's r uh, acquired right at the borehole top. So this is where we're in this situation with this vertical uh, seismic propagation. Um, and one that is more of an oblique shot where we have seismic energy coming in at an angle and we can look at the, the different cable performance um, on, um, uh, in those two data sets. So first of all, this is our shot at the borehole. Um, it, it's something of a, a counterintuitive um, way that these data are presented. I, I could go into why we present depth as an x-axis and not as a y-axis but I'm, I'm not going to you can look at another seminar for that one um, but um, here we have depth going from zero over the surface to just over 1000 meters travel time down here and this strong arrival that you can see coming in um, that's what we interpret as uh, the direct p wave um, you've seen, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, the frequency content of our data. Um, we're looking at 200 hertz 
with um, roughly a, a 200 hertz um, bandwidth. And that's pretty consistent all the way down uh, the length of the cable. But um, yeah, we, we can hammer um, sufficiently strong that uh, we can get down to um, a kilometer depth there and get really nice signal to noise ratios all the way down. Now, um, the fact that this is seems to be a, a straight line suggests to me that there's not a lot of velocity contrast within the glacier and there's certainly no reflections coming end glacially if there were reflections then they would be kind of like anti-parallel they'd be branching off from that initial direct p wave trend and, and they just simply aren't there however it's a bit more subtle than that because even though at first glance it just appears like a straight line it's actually not quite straight and that tells us that there are some velocity variations in there rather than just fitting a straight line to it what i've done is a, a cross correlation exercise so if i take a particular wavelet say at 100 meters depth and i compare its arrival time to a wavelet at 150 meters depth then i know that there's 50 meters difference between those depths and, and can figure out the travel time between them. So speed is distance over time. I can figure out very simply what the velocity is in the, the, in the interval between those two arrivals. So I've done that all the way down the length of the data. And this is the velocity trend that it defines. There's a little bit of noise in there, but on the whole, we would say that it, it's a largely constant velocity profile. 3,750 meters per second is very typical of, of cold polar ice. However, when we get down to the lower 150 meters or so of the glacier, we see this increase in, in velocities. And if you look at um, some of uh, Anya Dietz's work, then if you get velocities that are around 4,000 meters per second in ice, that's a strong indicator that you're in a rather well-developed anisotropic fabric. And so we can start to build up this um, this cross section through the glacier here, I would suggest that the majority of the store glacier column at this point is um, has a P wave velocity of 3,750 meters per second, but there is this horizon down here at something like 880 meters where we see increases in velocity up to 4,000 meters per second. Um, I'll come on to the implications of that in a few slides time. But that's not quite the end of the story, is it? Because you see in the lower part of the glacier, um, the lowermost part of the glacier, there's this velocity decrease. Um, now, I don't want to go into this too much because, you know, just in the interest of time, but when we compare the amplitudes as well as the velocities of this seismic response, and in particular, when we look at um, the temperature sense data that Rob Law at Spry is working on, um, it starts to be strongly indicative of us, of us having temperate, uh, temperate ice down here. So ice with, with a liquid water content. So um, I'm gonna leave that question mark there because it's, it's work in progress at the moment, but I think it's, it's strongly indicative of, of that structure. Um, that's our shot at the borehole. Here's our oblique shot. Now, because we're looking obliquely, this direct P wave is not a straight line anymore. It actually defines a, a hyperbolic trend because we're looking at energy that's coming in kind of along the hypotenuse of, of a triangle. So the direct P wave is curved. But here is another curve. And when you do a fit to this, um, you get a velocity something like 1,900 meters per second, which is very representative of an S wave velocity in ice. Now, I had no idea that a hammer and plate could be such a, an efficient generator of S wave energy, but, but there you go. The cable is, is picking up the S wave energy from these oblique shots. It's, it, it, it's really great, really fascinating. So um, I've done a similar exercise here where I did the cross correlations, P wave velocities in red, S wave velocities in orange here, and we've built up the P wave and the S wave structure, um, at least where we can see it for the S before the cable is insensitive to the particle motion. What you'll see here is I've also overlaid these, th this dash trend. That's the trend from the zero offset shot. And you can see it very nicely aligns with what we've got in this, in this offset shot. It's a little bit noisier down in the, the lower end of the cable, but you can still see there's this increase in velocity in, in the lower 100, 120 meters or so. So um, the other interesting thing that I would point out in this shot, though, is to do with the bed. Re oh, hello. Sorry, that's 
ignore that uh, that that velocity trend that's popped up there sorry there's a glitch in my slides what we're looking at is this central uh, panel in there um so what we can see is um is p wave reflections suddenly so we have the direct p wave coming down here if we had a bed reflection we would expect a reflection to kind of bounce off and come back up the cable but we actually see a reflection here slightly offset from the uh, from the direct p wave trend and there's a 44 millisecond lag in there now that means that i can't tell you anything about the specific velocity structure beneath the ice but if we've got this reflection coming in with this delay then there must be a subglacial reflection down there i don't know what its velocity or thickness structure is all i know is that that velocity and thickness structure must satisfy this 44 millisecond round trip and so what i've got here plotted against this blue line again sorry try and ignore these uh, extra labels down there um, i've got velocity and thickness pairs that satisfy this 44 millisecond round trip travel time so we can start to speculate about the kind of geometries that we have subglacially um, you see for any kind of plausible um, velocities we have um, the corresponding thicknesses here so it could be anywhere between 5 and 40 meters of, of sediment but what it did was to take the subglacial layer velocities from Kuhn Hofstetter's work at site S30 and to look what what thicknesses they would predict so um, Kuhn suggested that his velocities in this subglacial layer could occupy anywhere within that um, gray shaded range um, their preferred velocity model was was the red line and so what I might suggest is that Storr Glacier at this site is underlain by 20 meters with um, some certain uncertainty um, 20 meters of, of subglacial sediment so um, yeah that, that's a, a really nice result and uh, you know it's nice to see that we, we're, we're detecting uh, these these P wave reflections as well so um, just to summarise then, the, the model that we've got for Storr Glacier here, um, just building up all of the observations from, from the DAS um, experiment. Um, some implications here. I think around 880 metres we see this, um, this change in the vertical uh, P wave velocity structure um, and that's at 84% of ice thickness. That's consistent with the Holocene Wisconsin transition in, in this area. And that's work that was done by um, Nana Carlson. And again, it's consistent with where Kuhn Hofstede um, interprets, um, excuse me, interprets the same horizon at, at site S30. We think we've got um, temperate ice down there, so ice with a liquid water content. It's consistent with the seismic amplitude loss that we see. Um, I appreciate I've not gone into too much detail in this talk, but, um, it's available in a recently accepted um, geophysical research letters paper um, and it's also consistent with the temperature records that um, Rob Law is currently looking at. We also think that we've got sediment down there, we've got a low reflectivity glacier bed so very little contrast between the ice and the sediment itself but then this reflective subglacial horizon and again that's consistent with the observations that Kuhn Hofstede made. So um, I think this has been a really interesting and exciting experiment to, to have undertaken. Um, and this all comes from a couple of hammer blows. Of course, it's easy to say that because it's also got an, an expensive interrogator unit with it and it requires a kilometre deep borehole. But um, once you've got that, that, um, that system installed, you could monitor this long term. Um, we did a, the, all of those shots um, took place over the course of three days and had we had um, explosives available had we had um, a, a longer record to record the passive seismicity then we, we would have done it and we could have got uh, much much more now then uh, more bang for your buck if you're still not convinced I just mentioned the, uh, the time-lapse imaging and the englacial seismicity that we can do um, of course for free we get the the distributed temperature sensing that that um, comes alongside the das we can also do time lapse imaging either with active sources which i'll show you here um, this is the first suite of data that we recorded immediately after the borehole um, had been installed and so you get a whole series of reverberations in here that i think are indicative of um, the borehole not yet being frozen up and so in these particular areas the, the, um, 
seismic energy is reverberating within the water column and the, the, the fiber optic cable um, doesn't have um, a good coupling with, with the surrounding ice. Oops, hello, sorry, I slipped with my mouse there. Um, and we, we carried on shooting in these, these zero offset data sets over, um, over the first day that the borehole had been installed. And you can see that gradually those reverberations are settling down, the coupling in the cable is improving and eventually we get to kind of the same sort of data quality that I showed you um, a few slides back as the cable is entirely um, connected and coupled. We can also look purely passively. Uh, so um, meanwhile, you know, we, we're, we're going around shooting all these uh, hammer shots, but the glacier itself is moving and generating seismic energy from fracturing, rumbling across its bed. Um, and this is a snapshot that Andy took in the field of an englacial seismic event. Um, we go, I've got Royal Society funding to be taking a look at this with uh, Brad Lepofsky and Marine Dinal at Harvard. We're, we're intending to do some kind of machine learning approaches of, of this vast array of, of uh, sorry, this vast record of, um, of N glacial seismicity. It'd be really great to use some um, techniques to, to automatically extract out all these features. But what you can immediately see from this is that the apex of this response seems to come in at, you know, 320 meters maybe. Now the cable can't tell you the azimuth of, of where that response comes from, but it very clearly indicates that it's coming from 320 meters depth or so. Um, it, it's an englacial um, seismic event, you know, potentially a, a fracture or a crevasse opening up there. But this is just, uh, you know, a few seconds, a few sub seconds snapshot of a three day record. So um, some sort of machine learning approach would be uh, really cool for extracting out all of those, um, all of that seismicity. So just to summarize then, um, do we have a, a fantastic fiber optic future? Um, obviously surface surveys are much more normal, much more usual than, than borehole deployments. What I might suggest here is that for our conventional P wave surveys, which is what most reflection surveys are, maybe the surface survey, uh, the, the DAS cable is not so useful in that capacity, but the, the, a surface deployment and arrays of surface deployment could be great for S wave surveying. And that's whether the S waves are generated by the source, whether they're converted waves at depth, or whether they are um, uh, and glacial, uh, you know, natural seismicity. It could be really effective. Um, what I would say is that I still think that there's a place for our old friends. Um, I certainly wouldn't ditch my geophones yet, um, not least because the DAS cable has that directional sensitivity, uh, or rather a directional limitation that a three component geophone wouldn't. And I would certainly look to um, deploy geophones along the length of a DAS cable in a surface deployment um, if um, you know so we can capture uh, much more of the wave field. Um, however there are omnidirectional uh, DAS cables um, that are starting to become available where the cable isn't just sort of straight um, within um, its housing it's helically wound and they are um, sensitive to, to um, to, to all directions of particle motion. So um, may, maybe that's where the future lies. So um, just to summarize, first off, I must thank the whole um, responder team for a really successful field deployment. It was really good fun. And, and thanks very, very much for, for getting me involved. Um, I do think there's a really large potential for DAS, DAS methods in glaciology. So there is our paper out there that you can take a look at. It's just been accepted in geophysical research letters. And just very recently, um, uh, Fabian um, uh, Walter at um, ETH uh, uh, got a paper in Nature Communications um, where you can take a look at uh, more evidence of, of kind of natural seismicity um, on, a, on an alpine glacier. Um, I think that uh, it's the, the technology will be especially powerful at the moment when it's integrated with conventional geophones and especially, especially powerful when there's borehole control too. I think if, if you're looking to deploy a borehole, then seriously consider if, um, if, if a DAS survey um, could be installed alongside it and um, see what that can do for you. Um, there's lots and lots more to come from our own DAS data as well, so watch this space. We're going to be looking at the passive archive and also the azimuthal variation of all of those seismic properties. 
um, I think it's going to be a, a really big data set to interpret and I'm looking forward to getting stuck into it. So um, watch this space. Now, just before I wrap up, there are two other spaces that I would like you to watch. Um, first of all, the, the IC quiz is coming up. So on Thursday, the 11th of June at 7.30, um, it's basically an ice pub quiz, bring along a drink. Um, this is organized uh, partly by uh, Rebecca Schlegel uh, through the IGS and the uh, Cryosphere branch of the EGU. So um, do, give, um, do give that email address there uh, a, a bell if you would like to submit a, a, a team to the IC quiz. Um, I'm not sure what the prize is, but hey, everyone's a winner when you learn something about glaciology, right? There's prizes for all. Um, so uh, do consider putting a team in for that. And next week's seminar in this uh, IGS series, um, we're off to Mars uh, with Francis Butcher. So uh, I'm sure that's going to be a really great talk and I'd encourage you all to join in. So uh, that's me done. Um, I hope I convinced you that fibre optic cables are indeed fantastic and they offer us lots of potential. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Adam. There's a few questions on the chat, um, or if people want to ask questions uh, in a more conventional way, just type yes and we'll unmute you. But um, there's a few questions on the, the chat. I suggest you start at the bottom and work up because we've uh, answered some already. Yeah, okay, sure. So the, the one I've just seen here is um, the, uh, do, do we have geophones on the surface to constrain the passive ice quake hypersensors from Tom Hudson? Um, not on the surface, we don't know, but there is an array of geophones dotted around the place. Um, Charlie Schoenman is uh, working on that at, um, at Spry. Now, I think that a lot of the array, very unfortunately, failed, but um, just a few metres, I think within 20 metres possibly, of the DAS cable, there is a string of three um, borehole geophones, three, three component borehole geophones that are installed. So um, I do think it would be really interesting to compare the responses we see in the DAS with those that we see in those geophones. So yeah, absolutely, it's gonna be fantastic. Um, do the slight variations in borehole inclination from uh, Andre Glazowski, do the slight variations in borehole inclination make problems with the velocity estimations? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that they do. Um, Bryn assures me um, that the the vertical that the borehole is vertical, and certainly the the way that he's um, operating the drill, I don't think it's um, it, it's it's not likely that we have big um, big deviations in there. Um, but yes, I, I am sure that there is um, that there would be some um, problems with with that if that was the case. Um, I don't know how we go about controlling that. It's something I would have to. Um, take up with with Bryn. Um, the question from Brad, if there's temperate ice down there with some fraction of liquid water, shouldn't the P wave velocity be lower rather than higher? Um, yes, uh, indeed, Brad, I, I think it, it should be. So what I think is that we've got this kind of uh, interplay. Oh, and I see Tom might have answered that question, but yeah, absolutely, Tom. Um, we have this interplay between the faster conditions of the anisotropic ice, and then at the very bottom, we have that temperate ice coming in to, to kind of trade off against the increase in isotropy. So, um, yeah. Um, we have a question from uh, Gay Jin there. If the borehole was drained, how is the mechanical coupling between the cable and the ice was assured? It gradually fills up again. Um, there's an initial drainage and then melt water will flow into the to the borehole and gradually fill it up additionally at depth the the borehole will will compress and and, and squeeze um shut under under uh, pressure of the ice and indeed that's another one of the problems with using uh, conventional downhole tools in glaciology is that you quite often lose them um Bryn Hubbard would would tell you exactly about this so is there's part of the Larsen Sea ice shelf that has an optical televiewer stuck in it somewhere because of exactly reasons like that. You've got these deforming boreholes um, that, that gradually swallow your equipment if you're if you're unlucky. Um, I, I think that's all the questions. Let me go back to the interval. So, uh, Injani, um, yeah, absolutely. I will send you the the results of the out of the outreach poll. Yeah, totally. We'll uh, we'll do that. Um, question pop up there. Yeah, um, take another look at the, the ice quake waveform. I agree with you that there is a really interesting polarity flip there. I think that um, I, I haven't done the velocity analysis on this yet, and obviously it's it's unconstrained, it's ambiguous. 
I suspect that it's a P wave arrival because you see there's that little kind of gap in the amplitude response. And I think that's because we have energy that's traveling horizontally and arriving at the cable orthogonally. So that makes me think that it's a P wave um, with, uh, you know, and you, you, as you say, you, you have these polarity reversals in the upgoing versus the downgoing section of it. Um, but uh, of course, there's also a radiation pattern issue within the, the within the. Yeah, so yeah, well. sorry, uh, sorry for interruption. This is oh, good. Sure. And yeah, uh, yeah, just some comment because we're actually working on some uh, micro seismic dust moment tensor inversion uh, okay. using uh, using this, and uh, this uh, zero uh, amplitude is uh, at the center. You will observe this for the S wave as well because, as you imagine, if the S wave is uh, hitting the fiber vertically all the particle motions is along the fiber, but there's no strain change. So fiber is measuring strain mm. uh, rate, basically. Yeah. Um, so I highly doubt this is actually an ice wave, but I could be wrong. But uh, also if you look at the polarity of the dust data, it's not only depends on the particle motion, but also depends on the wave is propagates. So actually interesting enough that if this is an ice wave, uh, even though there's no noodle plan for ice wave at the epic, you still have a polarity. You can do a little bit of math by yourself, but uh, this is what we observe all the time in the micro data, mm. micro data. So let's assume this is an S wave. And also you can see it's actually having a very large aperture monitor just by looking at the curve of this. Mm. So that basically means that uh, at the center of this are probably the, uh, the uh, um, it's, 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 there's a new noodle plan change at the center. So that's, I, I assume that this is probably indicates the sleep, uh, sleep uh, fault plan should be either horizontal or vertical. So, uh, you know, this is a very well guess just looking at this data, but uh, uh, I just found that very fascinating. And, yeah, I, well, thanks very much for that insight. Um, I mean, a, a lot of my own work uh, has been on the interpretation of active seismic um, data sets. And so I wouldn't claim to be um, a, a micro seismic expert at all. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to having conversations with people like yourself who, um, you know, this stuff is sort of second nature. Um, you can instantly see what, what's going on with it. So, uh, yeah, really, thank you very much for that insight. It's really useful. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's thanks for sharing this. This is a really uh, interesting data set and, uh, to produce. Cool. Yeah. yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you find it. So I'm fascinated by it. Um, I did see a, a question pop up in the chat there from uh, Roland Vaughan. On the same slide here, yeah, we, we got this persistent feature at 880. Um, yeah, and, and I think it could be something to do with the changing strain in the, in the data there. You know, it always seems that there's this reverberation and you actually get this sort of ghost of um, reverberations in many of the data sets. And I'm not sure that I, I entirely understand what, what's causing that yet. Um, so yeah, I, it, it's a very good observation and I'm sure it has something to do with the transition there, but I, I couldn't tell you that I could um, explain it uh, right now. Are there, oh, one last oh, question. So how much does it cost for a DAS system compared to geophones? Okay, um, compared to, so if we're gonna say DAS system versus geophones, then there's kind of like a logic there. So um, the geophones is to, to cable kind of thing. So um, the cable itself isn't all that expensive. Um, it, it, oh, I think that uh, you know twenty five dollars a meter or something. I, I I think is would be considered expensive. Um, maybe there are people out there who um, from Silix who could could uh, comment to that. But the cable in, in its own right is not expensive. The expensive bit is is the interrogator system, and um, I'm sure that there are companies out there who would loan you one, um, or they'd come out and. And, and work with you. But the, the purchase of, a, of an interrogator system is currently in the kind of hundreds of thousands of, of, uh, of pounds territory. So um, they really aren't cheap. Um, as with all these things though, you know, prices come down um, with time. Um, I feel really privileged because of that, that we've been able to, to play around with one and get um, data like this. Um, but I, I do hope that in the future, um, they'll become much more accessible, uh, much more affordable, and therefore much more deployable um, throughout glaciology. 
Are there any last questions? That's a pretty good discussion, actually. So uh, I guess it just comes to say thank you very much indeed. Uh, for a really interesting talk, and thanks to everyone uh, for coming in and for such interesting questions. So thanks very much, everyone. Absolutely. Thanks very much all for, for your discussion. It's been uh, great to present. And uh, yeah, 